Yeah, hi folks. Now, I don't know if you know about New Zealand's SIS guide called Know the Signs or Not. Now, if you don't, it's a guide to help people recognise the signs extremists might exhibit. And this is designed to help counter terrorism, or so they say. But in reality, it's just another way for Adern to silence free speech, silence people who oppose her and her radical regime. Now, I didn't know about it myself until I came across the following from Redacted. So anyway, here's a news report um, that we pulled and uh, found this online today, which is a really good condensed version of it. There's some moments that are repl uh, replay the parts that I want to show you. So I'm just going to play this. This is the news report breaking down these booklets. Watch. Our Secret Service is launching an initiative to help us identify people who may have been radicalised. Know the Signs details dozens of indicators that a friend or family member could be planning a terror attack. As Adam Hollingworth reports, the move comes as our spy chiefs identify a new and worrying type of terrorism. Time was when the intelligence services were never seen, never heard. But now they're loudly proclaiming, your country needs you to keep an eye on those you know, and if necessary, dob them in. Dob them in. Recognising a potential warning sign and then alerting NZSAS or police could be the vital piece in the puzzle that ultimately saves lives. To that end, they're publishing a guide called Know the Signs. Now, folks, I've uh, recorded a couple of clips from that guide, and I'll play them shortly to help us all identify potential terrorists in our midst. To pay attention if they are, and to be alert so that if they see or hear about something that seems off, um, that worries them and concerns them. They like that little squiggly hair piece? Because that, that would, if I saw that, I'm, I'm calling someone on that, by the way. That, that does seem off. Also, have I had a hard time with the she accent. Might be a Kryptonian. Hmm. Yeah. She might be Kryptonian. Now, come on. Okay. But, I mean, she thinks that looks good, so let let, let her be. We don't make fun okay. of people based on their Here we do. Uh, appearances. But I lost my train <laughs> You <of thought>. don't. <laughs> don't. I don't think we should do that. Don't. don't yeah, anyway, go ahead. Um, derail. I just, I couldn't it, understand the, the anchor accent. To me that accent. What's that? The, whatever the news anchors, when they toss to this piece... Their accent was so thick, I needed subtitles. I didn't understand it. I apologize if anybody feels like that about my accent, um, but I, I needed to hear that again. <laughs> we don't need to replay it. Go ahead. Um, no, I want to get to the good part here. This okay. is on the road to actually committing an attack. The SIS has listed around 50 signs from obvious ones, like writing on a weapon, as happened in Christchurch, to... A person who is, who is really developing an us-versus-them worldview... Yeah, what she means is an us versus the Adern government worldview. Authorities say they're usually closely monitoring 40 to 50 potential terrorists. These people used to be motivated by their white identity or by their faith. But in the past six months, a third group has emerged, those motivated by politics. And so it could be the COVID measures that the government took, and so it could be the COVID measures that the government took, or it could be other policies that are interpreted as, as infringing on rights. Uh, and and, and it's a, what I sometimes describe as a kind of hot mess of, of ideologies and beliefs, um, fueled by conspiracy theories, fueled by conspiracy theories. Now, folks, people can be dobbed in and arrested for having fringe views. Extreme ideologies can be based on faith, social or political beliefs that exist on the fringes of society, outside the more broadly accepted views and beliefs of most people. Extremists may seek to radically change the nature of government, religion or society, or to create a community based on their ideology. Extremists may seek to radically change the nature of government. Now, based on that alone, Rawiri Waititi and Nanaya Mahuta should be arrested. Um, the Maori Party has clear goals that are in the public domain. That's, that's uh, Waititi. He said this, we have a 25-year plan 
They want self-management, self-determination and self-governance over all their domains. That is education, health, um, prisons, everything. They want a completely different uh, and separate uh, government in New Zealand than the one we have now. Um, they want a separate Maori parliament with 15 to 17 seats and control over $20 billion of annual incoming, uh, income ongoing. So they want the taxpayer to fork out $20, million, uh, $20 billion every year to fund this new Maori government. So what's co-governance all about? I've put Nani Mahuta there because she was one of the architects of Hei Pua Pua and I want to also give credit to um, the slide information to the New Zealand uh, Centre for Political Research for the information that you're about to see. So what Maori want is this. Two complete governments that overlap, a newly written constitution based on a new interpretation of the Treaty of Waitangi, at least 5% of all new procurement contracts must now go to Maori businesses, all government departments, agencies must now provide a report that shows at least 5% of the procurement of goods and services was from Maori businesses. And you can also add, Mahuta wants to control all of our water as well. Extreme ideologies can be based on faith, social or political beliefs that exist on the fringes of society outside the more broadly accepted views and beliefs of most people. Now, based on that alone, Jacinda Ardern should be arrested. As leaders, we're rightly concerned that even the most light-touch approaches to disinformation could be misinterpreted as being hostile to the values of free speech that we value so highly. How do you tackle climate change if people do not believe it exists? How do you ensure the human rights of others are upheld when they are subjected to hateful and dangerous rhetoric and ideology? But we have an opportunity here to ensure that these particular weapons of war do not become an established part of warfare. So freedom of speech is now a weapon of war. Now that is extremism on steroids. Because for every new weapon we face, there is a new tool to overcome it. For every attempt to push the world into chaos is a collective conviction to bring us back to order. We have the means. We just need the collective will. It's not the first time Bauer Hungry Ardern has slipped, uh, has had a true commie nature slip. Remember this Orwellian demand of her locked up and muzzled citizens during the pandemic? The most up-to-date information daily. You can trust us as a source of that information. Uh, you can also trust the Director General of Health and the Ministry of Health for that information. Otherwise, dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. We will provide information frequently. We will share everything we can, uh, everything you are, else you see, um, a grain of salt. Neil Oliver Ardern proudly trashed civil liberties and bodily autonomy during COVID, and now she's waging war on free speech. What's this about? For any politician to declare that she is the single source of truth is nothing less than dangerous. There's really no other word for it. And I, I could use stronger language if, if I was allowed to do so. But she is nothing less than dangerous. The likes of uh, Ardern, like uh, Trudeau in Canada, it's as clear as the noses on their faces that they fantasise about the kind of totalitarian control that's available to the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. You can see that they fantasise about when the day comes that they're able to round up their political opponents and those that disagree with them and just put them somewhere out of sight. You can see it, you can see it in their faces. And that she is taking to the world stage, that she's going to somewhere like the United Nations and calling on that audience where she evidently thinks she'll find support for her cause. You, you know, the, the world has to pay attention 
to the to the blatant declaration by people like Jacinda Ardern that for them the days of debate, reasoned argument, winning people over by the rightness of your cause are over, and all they want now is the right, the power, and the necessary technological levers to make sure that what they say goes. This this idea of misinformation, disinformation, those are yet more words that have been rendered meaningless by misuse. She doesn't mean misinformation or disinformation. What she's talking about is dissent. What she doesn't want to hear is a single voice raised against her. Exactly. Just like Xi Jinping. Now, folks, this is Paul Conway, Chief Economist at the Reserve Bank, and this was recorded three months ago. What is Reserve Bank doing around digital currencies like Bitcoin? Um, Bitcoin isn't a digital currency. It's, oh, well, there it's we a go. token. <laughs> um, it, it's a, yeah, it's a token. Like we're we're thinking hard about it. Like the the kind of relevant bit for us is around uh, CBDC, so central bank. Uh, digital currencies. Uh, a few central banks have uh, implemented uh, CBDCs a- across the world, and we are thinking about it. We've put some papers out. Uh, I think we're consulting on it uh, from time to time. There's quite a bit of work going on in that space, and it's just sort of, you know, is there a better way um, for people to sort of, you know, payments to sort of happen? You know, is it can we increase competition in the banking sector, for example, and sort of make make that whole sort of how we pay how funds move around the economy. We call it kind of the sap uh, in the sort of tree of Tane Mahuta that we sort of talk about uh, around here. How can we make that more efficient uh, and and lower costs? And I think a CBDC is a really important part of that uh, conversation. So it's very much uh, on the radar uh, around here. Now, folks, you can be assured Adern has her dirty, filthy, stinky fingers stuck right in the middle of this pie. Now, hat tip to uh, Peter Rhodes for this one. Why so many people seem to be concerned about CBDCs, and as the Forbes article states, the main concern is about control. A CBDC would give your government a level of power it's never had in history. And And that's exactly why Adern would love nothing better than to have a central bank digital currency most worrying part isn't necessarily that they would have access to all your financial data. It comes from the fact that a CBDC would be programmable, like the rules of a video game. Your government could program your money and the way it can be used. For example, it could be programmed so that you could only spend it on certain government-approved items or completely block you from purchasing some others. For example, again, only items your government deems to be essential. With a CBDC, they could also directly control how much of your money you spend, hypothetically limiting you so you could only spend a certain amount of money each day, or on the other hand, forcing you to spend all of it by a certain time period. And if you didn't, your money would just vanish from your account. At first glance, some of these ideas might sound a little far-fetched. Like you might be asking yourself the question, why would the government want to stop you, block you from buying certain things, and why would they want your money to expire? Well, here it's important to understand the reason reasons behind these possibilities and how these actions could become a reality when CBDCs enter our lives. Let's say your country's economy is struggling or stagnating. Your government could stimulate the economy by forcing citizens to go out and spend their money. This would be very easily possible with a programmable CBDC. First, your government could set your savings to expire within 30 days. Now, obviously, most people wouldn't want their money to just vanish, so instead would go out and spend it, causing money to flow through the economy. In other words, the exact outcome your government wants, enabling them to engineer the behavior of citizens. Another very plausible way a CBDC could be used to control the way you use money is by controlling your carbon output. We all know our world has become obsessed with carbon emissions, and very soon most of us will have a personal carbon limit enforced upon us, something already being tested or talked about in many nations on Earth. As 
as a CBDC would give your government access to your entire purchase history, they could also calculate your carbon usage. And if you go over your monthly limit, they could force you to stop creating more. For example, by using a CBDC to block you from buying gas for your car or a plane ticket, they could even cancel your ability to buy so-called high carbon food items like meat, coffee or rice. But instead of stopping you from buying these items, they could just fine you for producing extra CO2. And because they hold your money already, these fines could just automatically be removed from your account. These are just two examples of the powers a CBDC would give your government because of the programmable nature of this money. There are a lot more examples I could talk about on how a CBDC could be used to control a population. But before I go, there's only one that I really want to cover. One of the biggest concerns around CBDC is how they could be used to control free expression of people. In China, where a version of a CBDC is already active, people's social credit scores are linked to their bank accounts. And if they say the wrong things online, for example, in criticizing the government, their rights to use money goes away. For example, being limited from buying plane or train tickets, or even from buying certain kinds of goods. This is something the Chinese government has already enforced upon upwards of 23 million of its people. But most of us don't live in China. We live in societies that are considered much more open, liberal and free. But how long will things stay that way? Just a few days ago, the Swedish government voted to make it illegal for journalists to criticize the government. In Australia, freedom of expression is already not not protected by the constitution. And new proposed laws would allow government ministers to sue people critical of them. And in Canada, Justin Trudeau has already stopped mostly peaceful protesters from accessing their own money. This and folks, all of the globalist scum are in on this. Now, let's get into today's story. There's a lot of talk about digital currencies. Some people are excited about Bitcoin and those ones that sound like Ethereum and metals from superhero movies that could change the world, those kind of ones. Imperium, Objectivo, those kind of currencies. Well, new Prime Minister of UK and Goldman Sachs, former employee of the year and WEF protege, and I hope none of these things contradict one another or bring about a conflict of interest, Rishi Sunak or Radish Sinatra, as your President Joe Biden calls him. Rashi. Sunuk is now the Prime Minister. Is a keen advocate of CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Here he is, in fact, advocating for them. Today, I'm proud to say that under the UK's presidency, the group of the world's seven most advanced economies, the G7, is launching a set of public policy principles for retail central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Central bank digital currencies could be a digital version of money, a bit like a digital banknote. <laughs> I like it, because they've got a broad concept. Uh, hmm, what if this person's an idiot? Which we think that they are. It's like a digital penny for your digital money box, for your digital shithole that you live in. You will own nothing. You will be happy. <laughs> that could be used alongside physical notes and coins. For now, till we phase them out, if you start any little trucker protests, oh, where's my money gone? The digital piggy bank is broken, I'm afraid. Start being a bit more cooperative. Unlike most of the digital money people use daily today, it would be issued directly by a central bank, like the Bank of England in the UK. That's good, a central bank. Nothing wrong with centralised authority, centralised power, globalist decrees coming down from on high, avoiding democracy. That's exactly what we want. Keep talking. And governments and central banks across the world are working together. Oh, really? They're working together? Well, that's just such great news. The IMF, the World Bank. Why don't we involve the WEF and the WHO? What we need are unelected global bodies that have been able to co-opt political power, respond to financial power, and ignore and oppress ordinary people. Whether it's the recent medical emergency or the cost of living crisis, we're seeing the benefits all around us. I can't wait for your next policy. You're going to take our money now. This is great. Looking into what having a digital currency might mean in practice. I think I know what it means in practice. More power for you, no power for us. This includes issues that people care about, such as ensuring users' money would be safe and secure, that it could work with other ways to pay, would be energy efficient. Oh, it's got to be energy efficient. I was about to say, is it energy efficient? 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 Is
energy efficient. I've got to make sure. Oh, a few other questions. You wouldn't use this ever, would you, to implement control or to advance social credit type systems or to shut down the bank accounts of people you disagree with or to surveil people and have a surveillance network that you've developed in conjunction with big tech and now a financial arm that you're developing so that you can lock step together and gridlock us in a digital prison of surveillance tyranny. That's just just off the top of my head. Would be energy efficient. Bitcoin and those other digital currencies that we don't control, they're bad. They're not energy efficient. This one that we will control, that'll be energy efficient. So yeah, it's about energy efficiency. It's not about control. Control's like a side effect, just a side effect. Sorry, what? Is one of my eyes stopped moving? And available to everyone. Except poor people. A potential CBDC could offer businesses and consumers new ways to pay in the future. I expect it'd be convenient, would it? Would it be nice and convenient? Could I have some convenience, please? It'd be so convenient to be in my cell, all lathered up with a nice bubble bath of convenience. It's all part of the wider story of digital innovation that has delivered benefits to millions around the world and in the UK. Well, I was just talking to Edward Snowden and Julian Assange about the benefits delivered around the world whether it's the people of Iraq or Afghanistan or the many people now in Western Anglophonic countries starving to death and unable to heat their homes. What they need is the small amount of money they have got to disappear into binary code. These decisions raise important questions about the reshaping of our economy. Yeah, I've noticed you've been reshaping it so that ordinary people have no power at all, no alternatives or options, and we can operate entirely at the behest of powerful financial interests like Goldman Sachs. Have you ever heard? <laughs> you used to work for them. Oh. Financial systems and the way in which people interact with money and payments. What, like through like a massive hedge fund that funded Moderna? You used to be part of a hedge fund that funded Moderna. Oh. That's why working together. Like you work together with your wife, who's like a billionaire. Oh. In the UK earlier this year, I announced a new joint task force between the Treasury and the Bank of England to look into a potential CBDC as a compliment to cash and bank deposits. It's just a compliment. It's a lovely little compliment. Over here, you've got your money in the bank. Over here, you've got your digital thing. Oh no, what's this one doing? Oh look, it's facing it out, look. And now what's happening? We're in digital prison. Yeah, now folks, I'll stop it there. And folks, I've uh, posted all the relevant links below.